hello. Well, my vacation's over. Back, back to the humdrum, regular life. Um, there's a guy blowing leaves over there, so what can I say? I came to this beautiful spot, make a video. Well, I have a bunch of things I've been wanting to make videos about, and I just, I'm going to use this video to sort of sort, to, to dump them all out at once, and maybe I'll make more videos on them, or maybe this will be the videos on some of them. Um, one thing I've been thinking is that there's a lot of times I make a video, and it's like, well, I've said that, and I'm going to move on, but these are like on relativistic skepticism. Um, but these are things that that actually I could explain, explain more, and people don't necessarily understand my point. So I uh, wanted to make a couple of videos on relativistic skepticism. Uh, one from a kind of organic point of view of what it's what it's it's about, you know, because it's a philosophy that works like an adapter. If people have relativistic skepticism as a part of their philosophy, then it sort of gives you a certain way to be compatible with other philosophies which are different because you can build contradictory philosophies on relativistic skepticism, you know, different political philosophies or whatever. Uh, and then on the other hand, I just want to describe relativistic skepticism, you know, the skepticism and the relativism. Um, it's a simplifying idea, but so is the idea that the earth goes around the sun. Um, but it's, it can be confusing to people, it's subtly different. Um, but, you know, skepticism being the idea that all knowledge is theoretical, it's not certain, you know, and relativism actually being how you get the knowledge. I mean, people think that relativism is about, you know, anything goes because you, there is no absolute authority, but in skepticism you're not looking for an absolute authority. And the relativism is actually where you relate ideas and you compare them and you get a network of comparisons and you start to form ideas and knowledge from that. So the relativism is where the knowledge uh, actually comes from. Um, and the organic point of relativistic skepticism is you can actually adapt even like a dogmatic philosophy that's inherently non-relativistic and non-skeptical. You can still adapt it um, into a kind of relativistic skepticism. I mean, for example, in Christianity, uh, there is absolute knowledge, but only God knows it. You know, as a human being, just your basic Christian humility uh, should make you uh, skeptical, and the relativism, you know, follows from that as well. So, because we're all trying to tell the truth from different relative points of view. Um, I wanted to talk about potential and actuality. I think there's a, a pattern in all philosophical concepts. So, for example, there, considering your frame of reference, I mean, one part of your frame of reference is your environment, everything that, you know, impacts you. But then again, we don't know everything that impacts us, so, uh, um, you know, that's, that's the potential perceptions we could have if we noticed, but we might not notice. And these things are in our environment, in a sense, part of our frame of reference, but since we don't know about them, they're not part of our calculations about our frame of reference, right? So there's a, a difference here between actuality and, um, you know, in potentiality. And actuality always has to win. And it's a similar thing with uh, another thing I wanted to talk about, which is I really have this complete model of uh, enlightenment, morality, and spirituality, and how they all fit together in a skeptical and relativistic way. And I want to describe that model. And this potentiality and actuality thing is, is sort of a part of that because, you know, I've said that to be enlightened is to have a broader and broader frame of reference. And I think for some people that really crave to be enlightened, you know, that might make you think, well, I'm just going to be at one with the universe. But see, you don't know the universe well enough to be at one with it, you know. You, you might have a potential uh, interactions with the, everything in the universe, but you only have actual interactions with certain parts of it. And you can only understand the parts that you know. So you can't really be at one with things you don't know yet. Now, you can have a methodology so that, let's say, you meet aliens, and suddenly you know about these aliens and you can visualize a way that you are in common with these aliens. And I'm pretty confident that that's what would happen if I expanded, you know, what I knew about, but I could probably figure out a way to feel at one with it. But if that's not actual yet, then that's just a methodology. That's not me actually being at one with that. So in terms of our, of our own enlightenment, we have to be honest with, with what our actual knowledge is, not just our potential knowledge or how we think we'll react to knowledge we don't even have yet. Um, the, uh, 
it seems like there was another part of that I wanted to talk about. So those are all things I wanted to talk about. Um, there was something else there, but I've forgotten. So, so yeah, so I kind of want to talk about those things. I want to wrap some stuff up, describe my philosophy more. I want to start going into uh, some of my philosophy that it, see, it's relativistic skepticism, I'm arguing, that really from any point of view, uh, it's, it, you should adopt that part. But on top of that, there's things that are more personal, you know, like a philosophy of art. I'm into that, or, or, or a philosophy of artistic living, and those are going to be more personal, you know. Um, the, uh, the reason everybody should have a skepticism and a relativism is basically just from the cognitive model, you know. If you look at the material uh, world, uh, that's where you're going to find the, the criteria to judge these philosophies. I mean, like, for example, skepticism says there's nothing certain. And people say, well, that sounds like you're certain that there's nothing certain. Well, I mean, logically, I could play that logical game and point out, yeah, I mean, I'm not certain that there's nothing certain. It's just if I do know something uh, and it happens to be certain, I still won't know if it is certain or not until I check with reality, with the material reality. I might know for certain the sun is going to come up tomorrow morning. But until tomorrow morning, I don't really know if I was right. I can't be certain about being certain. So that you're never certain enough about being certain, about being certain, and so on. There's a regression there. Uh, but really, I don't analyze it that way. And I think the logical games make start to make a lot of assumptions already. And you just have to look in the material world. If you look in the material world, then you have to see you have a brain. Your ideas of the world are in your brain. And those ideas are there for models of the world. A model can never... Uh, be infinite, you know, 100% detailed. It can never correspond 100% to the thing being modeled, and it's not even supposed to. That's not even the point. They generally, a model is going to have simplifications, um, but even if you try to make it perfectly accurate, you know, it just can't be done. You can't model the whole universe. You, you can't model all the details in the world around you with just, you know, where you have less neurons than there are details. So we know that our knowledge is, is is made of these models and they can't correspond perfectly so of course there's always going to be a discrepancy between our models and reality and, and that means you have to be skeptical and um, uh, you know I, I think that's that's a pretty good reason to be skeptical in any philosophy and you pretty much can do it and like I said if you have a philosophy that's inherently unskeptical you can still become tolerant you know like the Catholic Church could become tolerant and realize, okay, well, we got to live and let live, even though these people are going to hell, you know, we're going to be tolerant. And that gives a kind of compatibility. If you make this adaptation, you can almost keep any philosophy you have, except for really, really belligerent ones that are really intolerant, openly intolerant. But as I say, you can modify intolerant, you know, philosophies to be somewhat tolerant and uh, almost have your philosophy unchanged and still comply with a relativistic and skeptical sort of framework for your knowledge. Um, I think over the long run that you'll find that the, that the impact of that is that there's a slow influence, subtle influence. It's like, it's like you don't really have to change how you think of the world when you realize that the earth goes around the sun and not the other way around. Um, but slowly over time, it does change your worldview makes you a little bit more relativistic. You start to understand things a little bit differently, you know. So um, that's how I, I feel about skepticism in general. When you adopt skepticism, at first the change is not nearly as big. You don't have to believe you know nothing. Uh, you just change the, your, your understanding of why you know something. And over the long run, yeah, you will reevaluate your knowledge. So I'd like to talk about that. I'd like to talk about... Um, uh, you know, more about some higher level philosophies and politics and stuff. And I'm really into politics. I might be talking about politics now that the election's full steam, you know. Um, I've sort of been, you know, compared to how much attention I usually pay, I've been stepping back because I'm just so burnt out on how stupid the philosophy and politics is. But, uh, but I am into that, so I've been watching that. And anyway, I'm back and off vacation, so feel bad for, for poor me back to, back to the regular regular life. Cheers.